Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Wednesday? I think it's one. No, it's Thursday. It's Thursday, December 3rd, and we will be hearing the presentation Legal Issues with Green Energy. I'm just having trouble with this week. I'll tell you what. Uh, for um, any technical issues you're having, you can type those questions in your chat box found in your GoToWebinar tool panel, and I'll do my best to try to help you through that. Uh, and for your content questions related to the presentation, uh, again, just type those in the chat box in your GoToWebinar tool panel, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2020. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, in particular, we are sponsored by the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration, which is a joint venture of the Maryland National Capital Area, Virginia, and West Virginia chapters, along with the Maryland Department of Planning, uh, Maryland Planning Commissioners Association, Rural Planning Caucus of Virginia and West Virginia University's Land Use and Sustainable Development Law Clinic. The intent is to address topics that may be of interest to people involved in planning at all levels across multiple regions. We've already had several of these uh, webcasts through us here, and uh, I think we might even have one more coming up still um, through the end of the year. So thanks to, to them for sponsoring this series. Coming up next, is a list of our upcoming sessions for for 2020 this is everything we have left for the year um and believe it or not we are scheduling deep into february already for 2021 uh, so head over to ohioplanning.org planning webcast and there's where you can get all the information on registering for our upcoming sessions today's session has been approved for 1.5 cm law credits for live viewing you can log your AICP credits by heading over to planning.org, logging into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage. Make sure you head over to Facebook and like us. Just search Planning Webcast, we'll pop up. That's where I post any uh, important information like date changes, time changes, or even when we have new sessions that are up on our website for you to register for. So be sure to like us. And we record all of our sessions and we post them up onto our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast Series. We'll pop up there along with our over 300 recordings. We have over 3,100 subscribers. So be sure to join us so that you get uh, notified when we post a new video. Um, we'll also have a PDF copy of this presentation available at the conclusion of today's session, again, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And finally, again, just remember to uh, type your questions in the chat box at any point, and I'll organize them and get them all ready, and uh, we will go through a Q&A at the end of the presentation today. That's it for my housekeeping items. I am going to Turn it over now to Joey Chen, who's going to kick us off. Let me get you some controls here. All right, Joey, it's all you. Great. Well, thank you, Christine. Uh, I hope that you all are able to see my presentation here. We'll just put this into presentation mode. There That's we go. Perfect. Good job. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joey Chen. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am a legal and policy advisor to Chairman Jason Stanick at the Maryland Public Service Commission. And before that, I was Assistant General Counsel at the Commission. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the PSC, the PSC is an independent state agency charged with regulating the activities of public service companies. And uh, the general areas of PSC regulation include. Uh, electricity, gas, water, telecommunications, and most intrastate for hire transportation services like taxi cabs, Uber, and Lyft. In my role at the Commission, one of my areas of interest is the siting of generating facilities and transmission lines. And the purpose of my presentation today is to provide an overview of the legal framework relating to solar siting in Maryland, and in particular, the siting of utility scale solar projects, because that is a hot area in our state. 
Additional resources on this subject are available on the PSC's website. We'll have a link. We'll have a we'll have that listed at the end of the of the presentations today. But today I will try to cover some more recent key legal developments that I believe will further drive the landscape on this issue. However, I'm first obligated to give the standard disclaimer that any opinions that I share during the course of this presentation are my own opinions and should not be construed as legal advice, legal advice, and nor are they do they necessarily reflect the opinions or views of the uh, Public Service Commission, uh, Chairman Stanick, or any of the other commissioners. So with that, I will begin. Um, <clears throat> Maryland has a strong general policy of being pro-renewable energy and pro-solar energy. In 2004, the Maryland General Assembly, um, that's the legislature, passed the Renewable Portfolio Standard, which places an annual requirement on electricity suppliers that a prescribed minimum of their electricity sales have to come from renewable energy sources, of which a specified percentage has to come from solar resources in-state solar resources, that is. Codified in Section 7, 701 of the Public Utilities Article, or PUA, of the Maryland Code, the program is implemented through the creation, sale, and transfer of renewable energy credit, credits, or RECs. Now, originally, the RPS in Maryland uh, requirement was 20% by 2022, with an in-state solar requirement of 2%, but over time, these targets have gone up. In 2019, the General Assembly passed um, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, or CJA, which set a new mandate of 50% renewables by 2030, of which 14.5% have to come from in-state solar. CJA also expanded Maryland's offshore wind program by incentivizing the development of an additional 1,200 megawatts of offshore wind capacity. And prior to CJA, the Maryland Commission had approved two offshore wind projects for a total of approximately 370 megawatts of renewable energy, and those projects are under construction. <clears throat> Suffice it to say, offshore wind is still relatively new in Maryland, and for the rest of this presentation, I will focus on the siting of utility-scale solar. The crux of utility scale solar siting in our state is the Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity, or CPCN. Now, a CPCN is essentially a license to construct, and any person looking to construct a generating station in the state, in the state with capacity of greater than two megawatts of electricity must first obtain a CPCN from the commission, and uh, this, of course, applies to utility scale solar. The uh, CPCN requirement also applies to the construction of qualified generator lead lines and overhand transmission lines, but uh, we won't cover that in this presentation. Now, projects with a generating capacity of less than or equal to two megawatts typically aren't considered um, uh, eligible or necessary for a CPCN, that is to say they are exempt from this requirement. And certain projects that are greater than two megawatts uh, may be exempted from the requirement with CP, with uh, uh, commission approval, provided that they meet the, meet the uh, specific criteria that you see on this slide. So I don't need to go line by line through these exemptions, but as you can read them, the exception, with the exception of land-based wind, we're talking mainly about on-site on -site generation capacity that's uh, that's at a capped capacity rating and then um, a requirement that all electricity that can be sold wholesale uh, must be sold to a local electricity company. So what you see here in this next slide is a, a flow diagram of the CPCN review process and it begins with the applicant filing a CPCN application with the commission. Now the regulations governing CPCN application and what's required when filing an application they're set forth by regulation in the Code of Maryland Regulations, or COMAR. The applicant is required to provide notice of the filing of its CPC and application to certain state and federal agencies, to the local governing bodies that are affected by the project, members of the legislature who represent those counties and municipalities, as well as all other interested persons. The commission also posts notice of any filed CPC and application on the commission website as well as social media. 
After the application is received, the PSC will docket it and decide whether to delegate it to an uh, administrative hearing examiner. We refer to those as the Public Utility Law Judge Division, or the commission can retain it uh, for its own. Now, once the commission issues its delegation notice or notice of retention, the, uh, the, the PSC or the PULJ uh, will then next schedule a pre-hearing conference where um, the PULJ will uh, establish a procedural schedule for the case that includes filing deadlines and also address any petitions to intervene. Um, I think it'll be helpful if I just refer to the PULJ path or track going forward. Now, one thing I'll mention, which I don't have on this flow chart, is a requirement that the PULJ make a, a completeness determination with respect to the filed, filed application. So that is whether the application is deemed complete for the purpose of proceeding with the rest of the review. Now, this is supposed to happen within 45 days of the CPC and application, but it may also be subject to the procedural schedule. The parties then proceed to a discovery phase if it's appropriate and necessary, and during this discovery phase, the parties can seek informational requests from each other, usually in the form of data requests, but they can also, inc they can also uh, take depositions of individuals. In accordance with the procedural schedule, the parties then file their testimonies, written testimonies, in support or in opposition of the project, as well as any recommended conditions for issuance of a CPCN. And it's at this time when the reviewing state agencies will forward the results of their independent review of the project application, usually in a document that's known as the po uh, Project Assessment Report, or PAR, along with any with their ultimate recommendation concerning the project and any conditions that may be um, recommended that are intended to granting of a CPCN. So usually one or more uh, public hearings will be held around the time of uh, uh, around the filing of the uh, party's testimony um, and these the purpose of these hearings are to solicit you know public comment uh, concerning the, the project and in most cases the PULJ will schedule two public hearings and if the project is proposed to be located in more than one county then the PULJ will schedule at least one public hearing in each of the affected counties after the public hearings are concluded, the PULJ will then hold an evidentiary hearing where the parties will be able to present and cross-examine witnesses. And at the conclusion of the evidentiary hearing, the record, record typically closes and the parties may be directed to file legal briefs. The PULJ will issue a proposed order, its decision, by a, a target date, which will automatically become a final order within a specified time frame. And, usually this is about 30 days, unless the proposed order is appealed to the full sitting commission or if the commission itself remands the case back to the PULJ. Now, I'll just take a, a brief moment to, to cover the parties to the proceeding. There are typically three statutory parties, and this is the Power Plant Research Program, which is a division of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Um, the Maryland Office of People's Council, which represents the residential ratepayer, and um, the Commission's own technical staff, which is primarily focused on the impact of the proposed project on the reliability and stability uh, of the uh, electric grid. It's worth mentioning that the Power Plant Research Program, or PPRP, plays a critical role in these CPCM proceedings because it coordinates the review and recommendations of state seven state agencies and these include the departments of agriculture commerce planning transportation energy environment and natural resources now these agencies effectively serve as the state's subject matter experts in their respective areas and they speak to most of the issues that come up in cpcn reviews except for the safety and reliability of the electric grid which i mentioned is covered by uh, the psc technical staff any interested person third party interested person may um, may engage and uh, decide to participate in the proceeding by filing a petition to intervene and once that petition is granted the uh, interested person becomes an intervening party with the same rights as the statutory parties listed here. And anyone else who just wants to follow the proceeding but not intervene formally can be added to the service list and then receive copies of all file documents 
going forward. So um, <clears throat> the legal considerations underscoring any decision by the PSC to grant or to deny a CPC an application are driven largely by statute codified under Section 7207 of the Public Utilities Article. And uh, what you see here outlines what we refer to as the due consideration factors for each CPC and decision. And that's to say that the PULJ the Commission must consider each of these enumerating fa enumerated factors before uh, making taking final action on a CPC and application. And these factors include um, the recommendation of the governing body of, of the county or municipal corporation in which the project is proposed to be located as well as the impact or effect of the proposed project on a number of factors that you see here, including economics, aesthetics, as well as you know environmental impacts there, air and, air and water pollution. But um, I guess for the purpose of, of the legal issues that may concern local interests here, uh, what's probably uh, critical to note is that for generating stations, the commission must also consider the consistency of the CPC and application the project with local government um, comprehensive planning and, and zoning, as well as any efforts by uh, of the affected parties to resolve any issues that have been raised and presented by the local governments. Additionally, the Natural Resources Article of the Maryland Code, this is a separate statute, also requires the PSC to give due consideration of any need to minimize impacts to forests. And this includes any provisions or requirements for afforestation or reforestation under the law. Now, going back to what I mentioned about PPRP, PPRP's critical role here addresses is to address these statutory factors, these due consideration factors in its uh, project assessment report, that PAR I, I mentioned, and, and in its uh, witness testimony. So along with its project assessment report, PPRP will also make the ultimate recommendation on behalf of the state agencies to either approve or deny, or even approve the application subject to conditions. Uh, and finally, I just mentioned that the Commission takes each CPC and as filed and must rely on the record developed in each case before rendering a decision. So um, the, I mentioned the licensing conditions and and uh, the commission may and usually does impose specific license conditions as part of granting any CPC. And in fact, since my time uh, at the commission, I, I have not been aware of any issued CPC and for a solar facility or, or any other generating facility that did not have licensing conditions attendant to the, the uh, CPCN. And these do not necessarily have to come strictly from PPRP, although PPRP by and large does uh, recommend the majority of those conditions. Staff and other parties can also recommend license conditions, and most of them, however, do go to mitigating the impacts of the project and to ensure that the applicant is in compliance with all necessary permitting requirements. And this can include local permitting requirements. Ultimately, it is left to the PULJ, to the commission, to adopt any of the recommended conditions, and the PULJ can, on its own, uh, add conditions or amend conditions that have been submitted. Once incorporated into the final order, these conditions become uh, enforceable. So now we get to the key, so several key um, legal decisions court decisions that I believe are um, important and critical for shaping the landscape going forward. And I'll begin with, um, you know, what I've what I've referred to as Washington County versus Perennial Solar, but in reality, it's uh, the full title is Board of County Commissioners of Washington County versus Perennial Solar. And I have that um, reporter citation listed right under the title if you're interested. In 2000, the 2017 edition of the uh, 7207 uh, E3 um, due consideration mandate, and that by that I re I'm referring to that due consideration requirement regarding with regard to the county's comprehensive plan and zoning. That was um, that was added uh, essentially as a compromise to try to bring county and municipal land use interests into the CPC and review and decision making process. In July of 2019, Maryland's highest court, the Court of Appeals, issued what is probably considered the um, most influential and seminal decision pertaining to utility scale solar siting in Maryland. 
So here in, in Perennial, the developer had obtained a special ex exception and variance from the Washington County Board of Zoning Appeals to construct an eight megawatt solar facility on land that was zoned for agricultural use. A group of landowners appealed that decision in state court and the Board of County Commissioners then got involved also opposing the project. The developer, Perennial Solar, requested an early determination of of a limited legal issue, that is, whether the uh, P PUA Section 7207, that's the CPCN statute, whether that statute preempts the county's zoning ordinance and gave the commission, PSC, exclusive jurisdiction to approve this type of facility. The lower court answered in the affirmative and the issue made its way all the way up to the Court of Appeals, which affirmed. The Court of Appeals um, opined that preemption is implied, whereas in this instance, the General Assembly acted with such force as to manifest an intent for the PSC to occupy the entire field. So um, some of the examples of that, the General Assembly, the, the Court pointed to the General Assembly delegating to the PSC the authority to implement the RPS as well as exclusive authority to approve generating stations in Maryland. So it is the PSC, not the county, that is the final approving authority for siting and construction of generating stations. The Court of Appeals, however, did recognize that local governments have adopted specific solar regulations as part of their own planning and zoning authority. However, where both county and the state have attempted to or attempt to regulate the siting and location of a solar facility, clearly only one can have a final say. And applying the principles of implied uh, preemption in Maryland, the court concluded that the legislature created an all-encompassing statutory scheme, giving the PSC the final say in solar energy regulation. Um, to be clear, however, the court did state that the legislature carved out a key role for local governments uh, in the PSC review process in that the statute requires local government uh, consideration of the local government's comprehensive plan and zoning regulations. But it does, does not require that the local zoning authority approve a generating station before the PSC decides to approve and grant a CPCN. Rather, the court uh, stated that the local government is a participant in the CPCN process, but its role is advisory to the commission. The perennial solar CPC in matter itself is still pending before the PSC. So uh, perhaps as a signal to of the effect that perennial solar will likely have on futures solar development and permitting decisions in Maryland, the Maryland Court of Special Appeals, which is the intermediate appellate court, recently reversed a CPC and decision by the commission in an unreported opinion in the matter of Frederick County versus LaGore Bridge Solar Center. And by recently, I, I literally mean just last week, the, the opinion came down. Uh, there, the PULJ had granted a CPC into LaGore Bridge to construct a 20 megawatt solar facility in Frederick County. And what's interesting about this case is that LaGore Bridge had already gotten zoning approval from the county for a special, ex special exception. And this was before it filed the CPC in application. But during the course of the CPC and proceeding, Frederick County then amended its zoning laws and created a commercial solar facility floating ordinance aimed at solar development, which effectively negated that special exception. The county asked the commission, uh, the PULJ, to consider the new zoning criteria, but in the end, the PULJ granted the CPCN, which uh, when the county appealed, the full commission then affirmed. The county took the matter uh, to court up to the Court of Special Appeals, and the appellate court reversed and has remanded the matter back to the PSC. The court found that the commission erred in its bases for affirming the PULJ, pointing out that during the course of the CPC and pr proceeding, there were several uh, significant changes to the legal landscape that affected Lagore Solar Project and the application. For example, in addition to the change in the county zoning laws, the court cited the, the Maryland legislature amending the CPCN statute to add that 
due consideration requirement uh, with respect to that uh, consistency of the project with the local comprehensive plan and zoning. But instead of addressing this due consideration factor, the, co the court pointed out that the PSC affirmed the PULJ based solely on the special exception and saying that this gave the developer a vested right um, because it was obtained before the county changed its zoning law. And to deny the CPCN in that instance would deprive the developer of due process. The court disagreed, found this erroneous, and observed furthermore that the commission could have but expressly declined to apply its preemption authority, which was recently affirmed in the perennial solar decision. The uh, appellate court remanded the case back to the PSC to allow the commission to consider in light of perennial solar, what weight to give the county's comprehensive plan, zoning and efforts to resolve issues with regard to the project. LaGore Bridge is not the first application, will not be the first application of the perennial solar decision by the PSC. The first application uh, was in this case that you see here, Biggs Ford Solar, uh, which the commission issued its uh, final uh, order just before the this Thanksgiving holiday and uh, granted the CPCN to construct a 15 megawatt solar facility in Frederick County. Now, this CPCN application was filed in early 2017. This was filed before the perennial solar decision came down. And in uh, the first phase, that is pre-perennial solar, the PULJ issued a proposed order denying the CPCN application, which the full commission remanded to the PULJ. Then after the perennial solar decision came, came down last July, the PULJ issued a second order in phase two of the proceeding, now granting the CPCN, which the commission affirmed just last week on appeal. Uh, this case, curiously, this case involves the same floating zone classification ordinance in Frederick County that also applied to LaGore Bridge. But unlike LaGore Bridge, um, Biggs Ford chose not to pursue any zoning um, approval. Instead, the applicant went straight to the PSC and filed its CPCN application and relied instead on the commission's preemption authority. This action, as you can imagine, led to the county intervening in the proceeding and opposing the project as well as PPRP and the reviewing state agencies recommending denial of the project. The PULJ denied the application during phase one after concluding that Biggs Ford had failed to meet its burden of demonstrating that the project is in the public convenience and necessity. And notably with respect to the county zoning ordinance, the law judge believed that it was unnecessary and even futile to require Biggs Ford to seek zoning reclassification because if you were to apply the ordinance, it would result in an attempt to either to severely restrict or ban utility scale solar facilities in the county. On appeal to the commission, the commission disagreed with the PULJ's conclusion that the new zoning ordinance amounted to a de facto ban on solar in the county. Uh, and given that the county's ordinance was new, Biggs Ford should have the opportunity to seek zoning reclassification. Uh, so Biggs Ford did just that and was denied by the county. And during phase two, the uh, PULJ issued a second proposed order, this time granting the CPC an application. The PULJ determined that in addition to remedying the de deficiencies in phase one, the project's benefits and contribution to the state's RPS outweighed the project's inconsistency with the county's comprehensive plan. The PULJ again concluded that the county zoning ordinance effectively was a de facto ban on utility scale solar in this county and he that is the law judge held that it was proper to apply the psc's preemption authority the county appealed this decision to the full commission and last week the commission issued a final order affirming the pulj's phase two order the commission cited two decisions by the maryland court of appeals including um, the perennial solar decision and the commission also affirmed the PULJ, PULJ's decision to rely on the state's RPS um, <clears throat> targets in evaluating whether to approve the CPC and application. So 
This, in my view, reflects a measured balancing of interests when deciding what is in the public convenience and necessity, especially with regard to solar projects. Now, uh, there is one other court case that I'd like to briefly mention, and although it doesn't relate to utility scale solar or the CPCN requirement, it does concern the reasonableness of restrictions, particularly homeowners association restrictions on rooftop solar paneling. Homeowners in this case installed uh, solar panels on the front and back roof of their house, but this was in violation of the homeowners association's declaration of covenants, which restricted the installation of any solar panels only to the, a rear facing roof. The homeowners did not get prior HOA approval before installing the panels and the HOA sought an injunction to have the homeowners remove the panels from their front roof. The trial court found for the HOA and on appeal, uh, the appellate court, Maryland Court of Special Appeals, affirmed and reached two conclusions. Number one, that the HOA's policy of restricting the installation of solar panels just to rear facing roofs did not constitute an unreasonable limitation under the applicable statute. And two, because the limitation was deemed reasonable, the HOA did not act in bad faith to enforce that policy. So um, recent developments uh, in, within the last year, <clears throat> in addition to perennial solar, they're at the state, state level from a policy side of things. In August of 2019, the Mar Maryland, Maryland's governor, Governor Hogan, established a task force on renewable energy development and siting for the purpose of examining renewable site, energy siting issues, and in particular, the siting of utility scale solar on alternative locations other than prime farmland. So for example, brownfields um, and parking canopies. Over the course of 12 months, the task force held a series of public meetings to explore and come up with consensus-based recommendations for changes to the state law, policies, regulations, as well as discuss resources and available tools that would incentivize responsible renewable energy development and siting. The task force released an interim report in December 2019, which identified as a set of preliminary recommendations, and this led to some legislative changes that were proposed uh, earlier this year to 2020, such as the waiver uh, of certain voluntary cleanup uh, application fees if a person intends to use a Superfund site uh, to site renewable and clean energy generation. Uh, and this change was adopted at the conclusion of the most recent legislative session. Now then COVID hit and despite the COVID pandemic, uh, the task force released a final report on August 14, 2020. Um, this report outlines 14 recommendations and specific actions. Uh, and while I don't have time to go through these recommendations, I will just mention that one recommendation in particular focuses on reviewing and assessing ways to enhance the CPCN uh, approval process to be more efficient, particularly as it relates to renewable energy projects. So um, coming down the home stretch here, the, the timing of the REDS task force recommendation coincided with growing public concern over perceived delays in the siting and development of uh, solar projects in the state. On the one hand, solar developers uh, have expressed frustration with approval of delays at the local level, um, and on the other hand, the local jurisdictions have raised serious land use concerns and, uh, and concerns regarding sufficient notice and opportunity for, for locals to get engaged and participate in the CPC and review process. So in an effort to address the concerns, the PSC will be initiating a future rulemaking to address, um, to, to examine uh, potential amendments to the CPC and application requirements uh, as, it, as they would apply to generating stations. Now, there have been um, efforts, significant efforts to get interested stakeholders involved early in this process, even before a formal rulemaking petition is filed. And last month, stakeholders submitted comments, recommendations, and suggestions to help inform the PSC technical staff uh, when it um, files a formal rulemaking petition later this month. 
While I can't predict what's going to be in staff's rulemaking petition, I can share one idea that's been suggested by the stakeholders and discussed, and this is to include a pre-application requirement that the applicant engage with local officials before filing um, its CPCN. And um, this would not only provide advance notice of to the local jurisdiction of the project, but it would also allow the county to raise, address, and potentially resolve issues ahead of time um, before the applicant then files the CPCN. So this concludes my presentation. And at this time, I would be happy to um, turn things over to uh, Joe, if I can figure out how to I got it. Okay. Joe, those controls are yours now. All right, great, thanks, uh, Christine. I'm gonna go ahead and, and get my first slide up and let's make sure. All right, how's that look, Christine? Am I good to go? Um, I just need you to uh, hit display settings and duplicate, or oh, I'm sorry, swap. A swap, there you go. all right, good, there we go. All right, Perfect. thank you. Well, thank you, Christine, and thanks for everybody for attending today. And thank you, Joey. That was really informative. And, and I think as I go through my presentation, it's going to be interesting to see the differences um, on the siding issues and the authority between uh, Maryland and Virginia. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a Virginia native um, and, you know, uh, went to school here in Virginia. I have an undergraduate degree in geology, but really got interested in planning and went back and got a master's from Virginia Tech. Um, I've worked uh, both with and for uh, local governments on planning issues uh, for uh, roughly about 20, 29, 30 years now in Virginia. And for full disclosure, I'm on the executive committee of one of the sponsors today, the Rural Planning Caucus of Virginia. Um, let me go ahead and, and as I go through the slide, uh, just kind of weave a story of, of what's been going on in Virginia. Um, this past General Assembly uh, legislative uh, session was quite historic uh, in terms of renewable energy in Virginia. Um, we had new legislative majorities in the House of Delegates and Senate. Um, the House of Delegates have been under uh, one party rule um, by the uh, Republicans going all the way back to roughly 2000, 2001, uh, most of the time that I've been a registered lobbyist here in Richmond. And um, they uh, saw the switch and the Senate also had a switch over to Democrats. So you had um, the Democratic uh, Party controlling both chambers and um, the governor, uh, governor's mansion. And so they set out some ambitious goals for reducing and eliminating carbon emissions. You know, by way of reference, uh, Joey sh showed that, uh, you know, Maryland all the way back in 2004 had set up a mandatory uh, renewable portfolio standard. For years in Virginia, advocates have been pushing for that, but it had always been voluntary. Uh, and, and I'll get to that, uh, the change that uh, now has a mandatory RPS. But I think what we need to do first is go back and look at some of the more recent history as it relates to the siding of utility scale solar, because um, going back about 11, 12 years ago, really kind of laid the groundwork for where we are to, today. Um, that you'll see has, will go into a hyperdrive once we get to uh, the big legislative changes from the last uh, General Assembly session. So in 2009, the General Assembly decided to provide an incentive for um, projects up to 100 megawatts or less um, to bypass the State Corporation Commission, which is the Virginia counterpart to the PSC in Maryland. Um, now, however, and this is important to point out, not just for the, the PBR rule, but also um, for even if it goes to the commission, it's still subject to local zoning and land use authority. So there is no preemption of local land use authority when it comes to the siding of, of any energy generation uh, in Virginia, regardless of type. Um, what the permit by rule means is you just go through the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, they um, make sure you're addressing any impacts related to the environment or natural or historic resources. Uh, pretty much checks the uh, check the boxes, and as long as you you know address any impacts, you get a, a letter um, giving you the, uh, you know the go ahead, and so you kind of bypass the whole certificate for uh, public need um, through the state corporation commission. Now I will say that um, even though it was adopted in 2009, um, we didn't see our first um, application 
until 2015. Uh, and to give you an idea of how it's uh, ramped up since then, there were a, a handful in, in a couple years after that, but then it really started ramping up in 2017 and 2018. And even today, uh, as um, we're still in 2020, we've seen over 70 notices of intent um, to go by the permit by rule for, for these projects. In 2017, the General Assembly actually upped uh, that threshold from 100 megawatts to 150 megawatts. Uh, to bypass um, state corporation uh, commission approval because you were starting to see a lot of projects uh, getting a lot larger. And typically what had happened um, when we first started to see these projects, they were coming in right at 20 megawatts. And why that was so was that um, the 20 megawatts, um, if you're at 20 megawatts or less, you have less requirements for interconnection to the grid um, uh, and that's the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission requirements. Um, what we started to see though um, is projects coming in at 50 all the way up to 150 megawatts uh, and they really jumped in size and that means they really went from kind of a distribution model to more of a transmit transmission model um, the other part of that bill from uh, 2017 it allowed um, uh, electric cooperatives and the incumbent utilities to participate in this process prior to that it had just been independent uh, power producers the other change that they had in 2017 was an incentive for small agricultural generators. This would allow a farm or other business uh, to go up to 100, uh, 1.5 megawatts of renewable energy uh, at 150% of the expected uh, annual, annual energy consumption, uh, so long as it didn't um, it, you know, take over more than 25% of the contiguous land controlled or owned by the agricultural business. You know, I had checked just recently with the incumbent utilities and we have yet to find anybody that's taken advantage of that. And I think that's, it speaks volumes to if, if you have a farm operation, you're either gonna go all in on solar and lease or sell your, your, your acreage to go to a much higher uh, uh, um, wattage or megawattage. Now, the other part uh, of this uh, incentive package also goes to the tax incentives um, leading up to this, this past session. Um, back in 2014, um, the General Assembly um, provided a full exemption on the locality's machine and tool tax, which is kind of a, considered as a personal property tax. The, the history of the machine and tool tax in Virginia uh, goes back away, and it's actually was created as an alternative to the local property tax for businesses to provide an incentives for manufacturing and production. And, and most M&T tool taxes are, are at, at very, um, I think, in, you know, incentivized rates at the local level. But what the General Assembly said is any um, generating equipment at 20 megawatts or less for solar is fully exempt from the machinery and tool tax. Um, and we saw a lot of projects coming in at, at 20 megawatts. Um, there was one in particular project on the eastern shore in Accomack County. It was the first really big mega project in Virginia in 2016, and, and that was 80 megawatts, and that was to sell um, electricity by contract to, to Amazon. And what was interesting about that is the applicant had gone for a permit by rule um, at four 20 megawatt uh, sizes uh, through DEQ um, to go ahead and, and kind of game the system and get the full 100% exemption. Um, but the SCC said, um, hold on a second, um, you're doing for one interconnection at 80 megawatts, so no, you don't get this exemption, it's an 80 megawatt project. And so that one is, it has no um, uh, mandated exemption on local taxation. So the General Assembly came in and said, all right, 2016, let's go ahead and change this a little bit. And it really put us on par with North Carolina, uh, similar to the tax exemptions they have there. And so it was a full exemption uh, for projects five megawatts or less, and then 80% exemption for projects greater than five megawatts. Now, what was interesting too was back at that time, the General Assembly said, all right, we don't want this to go on in perpetuity. So for projects that are gonna be greater than 20 megawatts, this mandatory exemption shall not apply um, uh, for any project that begins construction after January 1st, 2024. And, and when I get to uh, this year's legislation, I'll come back to that point. Um, VACO, uh, the Virginia Association of Counties who I represent, um, we came with a modification to that in 2018. And what we said is, look, if you're gonna be greater, uh, 150 megawatts or greater, um, 
you should not get just this mandatory 80% tax exemption. That um, should be up to the localities. And part of our reasoning here was, look, uh, it, it aligns well with the permit by rule, which was gone up to 150 megawatts. And the other part of that is once you get to 150 megawatts or greater, you're talking not just hundreds or thousands of, of um, acres, you're talking square miles now. Uh, in fact, you know, by point of reference, there was a project uh, that's been approved in building in Spotsylvania County that's 500 megawatts. I think it might be the largest project uh, east of the Mississippi. And that takes up roughly about nine square miles. And so our, our reasoning here was, look, um, if you're gonna do this, leave us with the authority to provide the, the tax incentives. And so that did pass. Um, now talking a little bit about the land use incentives leading up to the 2020 General Assembly session. Um, in Virginia, uh, in the law, we have um, what's known as a, a substantial accord um, review uh, in our comprehensive plan. And the way that it's set up in, in the code is that uh, any uh, public service corporation, you know, when citing uh, their facilities, um, you know, must get uh, it being in a substantial accord with the comprehensive plan before getting approval. And what what you're doing there is you're looking at the you know the location, the character, and extent of that, and seeing is this is this in line with what your comprehensive uh, plan is. And the process usually plays out is that you go for your substantial accord review first, and then you go for any necessary land use applications after that. What the General Assembly wanted to do was to allow for both the sub, uh, substantial accord review and any rezoning or special exception of pro process uh, for utility scale solar at the option of the locality to have those be advertised and approved concurrently. Um, so that was one incentive there. So that brings us to what happened um, in 2020 in the Virginia General Assembly uh, regular session. So we established a, a mandatory renewable portfolio standard, um, and this is aimed at 100% clean energy uh, by 2045. And um, you know, one thing to note about clean energy, that also includes nuclear, and I'll have something to say that, about that in a second. Um, it requires the development of significant amount of wind and solar, uh, the, the wind particularly offshore, uh, and the solar onshore, you see those numbers there. But one of the things that's important to note is Dominion Energy, which is the largest incumbent utility, um, you know, provides uh, you know, the majority of, of the energy here in Virginia and serves most of our, our urban crescent. Um, they file what's known as an integrated resource plan or IRP every couple of years. And their most recent one they filed, they significantly up these numbers to more than uh, 30,000 megawatts or three gigawatts of, of solar and 5,000 megawatts of offshore wind. Uh, and then also um, 5,000 megawatts of battery storage or, or energy storage capacity. And, and you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second about um, battery storage. You know, one of the things that uh, is interesting in, in looking at this is how are we gonna get there in Virginia uh, looking at the IRP, there was a couple of issues that I think will, will have to be solved if we're going to get um, all of our production in, in clean energy uh, uh, pots. And first is the winter peaking problem. So when you don't have as much, uh, you know, sun and solar, and you have a great demand for uh, energy during the winter months, particularly if you're heating with electricity, you're going to need a fallback. The other problem is the excess production from both wind and solar when you don't need it as much in the spring and, and the fall months. And so, you know, it's, if you think about it, the, the, inter, the winter peaking problem is an import problem. Are you gonna be able to import enough through the grid and can you get it from renewable energy sources? And then you have the export problem. Will you be able to offload um, this energy during those months. And I think part of what's going to be interesting to see play out is it really depends on what generation is happening in other states. Uh, North Carolina is, is ahead of Virginia right now on the amount of solar that they have. You see Maryland's got some uh, goals there, particularly offshore wind and solar uh, that Joey showed. So we may be flooding the market at those time frames with energy and for it to go no, uh, have not go anywhere. I talked about um, nuclear um, I think it's unclear what the future of nuclear uh, generation in Virginia will be. Um, we do have two um, nuclear power plants uh, in Virginia, 
that roughly uh, provide about a third of the baseload energy for the, the incumbent utility Dominion in this case. Um, you know, will there be any uh, new nuclear um, between now and 2050? Um, I think it's doubtful. Uh, I think you're going to see, you know, the extensions have already been granted for the current nuclear. It'll be a part of that base load. But I think with the significant amount of capital that's going to be tied up and invested in wind and solar, and plus of all the, I think the federal permitting issues, I think you're just going to see it all in on wind and solar. Now that's not to say that maybe somewhere down the road um, with, you know, the next generation of modular nuclear uh, units, we might not see something uh, that going beyond 2050. The other thing I'll note is that all of these new mandates are deemed in the public interest. Uh, so what this means is that while the State Corporation Commission still has that regulatory authority, you know, to address what the costs are borne by the customers, customers, they must ultimately approve the projects. And the utilities will get um, a fairly good return on investment of profit, which is approximately about 10%. Um, one issue that I think has not has garnered scant attention, in, and this in, is in terms to cost and, and investment, but it was uh, identified in the Dominion um, Integrated Resource Plan, is the billions of dollars in transmission and distribution upgrades to accommodate all of this, because we're talking about a, a totally different paradigm of how energy is generated and then how it's dispatched uh, across the grid. Now. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about battery storage when it comes to local land use considerations, um, but it's worth noting, I think, that the current technology in, in chemical battery storage units uh, limits its application to only frequency, frequency modulation and peak shaving. Uh, it's not currently a dispatchable source of baseload energy, and, and if, you know, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but maybe we can get to the Q&A and I can explain a little, uh, a little bit more about that. Um, you know, all of these mandates um, that are trying to get us away from retiring these generating units that emit carbon dioxide by 2045, there is that one caveat is unless the retirement of a particular unit would threaten grid reliability and security. You know, going back to the Dominion IRP, you know, they recognize that even with all of these ambitious targets that the storage uh, technology might not be there yet, it might not be feasible, so they include in there um, producing uh, 970 megawatts of potential new gas peaking plants to get us to baseload uh, when it's needed. All right, so now going back to the local taxation issue. The General Assembly came up with an option for localities to replace their machinery and tool tax that I talked about earlier with an energy tax of up to 1,400 megawatts of capacity installed per project. Um, it doesn't apply retroactively, um, so it's, it's only those projects for which an application was filed um, by July 1st of this year. However, an applicant or an owner for a previously approved project may voluntarily uh, enter into an agreement to be subject to that. Um, and this uh, last bullet here gets back to the state mandate from the exemption from local tax. Um, and, and this was kind of a bitter fight, I have to admit, because we really felt from the locality's perspective um, that, you know, what they had done in 2016 to expire it in 2024, they should have held to that, but they extended it to 2030. You know, the big questions for, for counties and localities is how does this compare with their current machine and tool tax? Um, you know, the answers are not easy to come by, and it really depends on a variety of factors and guesswork. Um, when we get to the q and I can delve more into the nuance of these comparisons. You know, clearly one advantage going this route is knowing with certainty for both the county and the developer what the annual tax burden and revenue will be. Um, however, I, I will note that this approach did not include a cost of inflation. Um, and I think from a county's perspective, this really kind of is decided ne decidedly negative strike uh, against using this uh, approach. There might be some move in the upcoming uh, legislative session maybe to address that. Um, the other thing that they did, um, and this was a concession um, for, I think, localities that are going to stick with the mandatory uh, uh, machine and tool tax, even though they did extend it, um, the mandate to 2030, they provided a step down. So this reduces that mandatory exemption. It, even though it's 80% in the first five years of operation, it goes down to 70% in the next uh, six to 10 years and 60% exemption for years uh, 11 and beyond. Um, you know, one note uh, to make here, and, and for those in Virginia that have been getting into this, there is 
a distinction between um, how these projects uh, get valued and the tax rates that it comply. And this goes to the size. Anything greater than 25 megawatts in size, and this is regardless of energy source, this could be coal, nuclear, wind, biomass, um, the machine and tool tax rate is limited to what the underlying uh, real estate rate is for locality. And in most cases, that's a lower rate. So that is an important distinction uh, there. Now, land use and zoning, um, there were uh, quite a few bills that were in the hopper there. One was um, special exception for uh, solar photovoltaic projects. And, and usually at the local level, most of these projects in, in embedded in the zoning ordinances need to get some sort of uh, special exception or special use approval, which is a discretionary approval by the local elected body. And what this did, uh, HB 655 and Senate Bill 870, the companion, is it, it provided um, more ability for the solar developer um, to ameliorate the impacts um, related to the project. Um, you know, it could be you know, due to transportation, um, you know, uh, issues related to stormwater and help pay for some of those. So it provided, I think, a, a better negotiating field for both the developer and the, and the locality. Um, there was a bill also that um, it, it set up a um, option for localities as a part of their zoning ordinance to adopt the national standards for solar equipment. And, and if you look up the bill, you can see what they referenced there. It's, it's I think, the ANSI standards for certain things. Um, now, the way the bill was originally written, there was kind of a, a subtle provision there. It was a, uh, an enactment clause that said, regardless of whether a locality adopts this ordinance, these standards shall apply. Um, we were successful in getting that enactment clause out. And, and the reason we, we needed that out is our concern here, and it, I think it was borne out when we heard the testimony um, from the, the lobbyists for the developers, and when we talked to them, they clearly, wanted to see um, localities not ban certain types of solar panels or certain types of batteries or batteries in general. Um, and they felt like a one size fits all should apply across uh, Virginia's um, localities. We, felt, we strongly felt that it should still be up to the local uh, authority of the local elected body. And so we were able to win on that. Uh, the last bill, which is really interesting, I had mentioned the comprehensive plan review. This actually gives a locality uh, an option uh, to provide a waiver completely to the comp plan review um, for um, the, the solar uh, developers or, or solar utilities. Um, it is interesting that there's one specific type of, of public service corporation, you know, namely utility scale solar, is being treated differently than the others. Um, so I think you know, you're starting to see a real shift here to give it an advantage, I think, uh, and um, priority for this type uh, in terms of local land use. You know, one little sidebar, um, you hear it a lot, not just on this um, uh, topic, but on other topics, affordable housing and others, but you hear the NIMBY complaint. And we heard this from developers. They, they hated to see, you know, these projects be held up at the local level because neighbors didn't like them. And, you know, I, I think, you know, NIMBY gets thrown out a lot. Um, it's, it's a convenient way to uh, label an opponent, but I think there's a lot more nuances uh, to this. You know, I know in the project in Spotsylvania, the neighboring county uh, saw their uh, country roads where all of this was being delivered, all the steel and concrete and the glass to, to develop these panels had ruined those, those, those county roads. They weren't met for that kind of truck traffic. So there's really impacts that I think still need to be in the purview of the local governing body and to address legitimate concerns that, uh, plan, that the planners and the planning commissions and the neighbors will have. Um, the last bill, uh, I'm coming down the home stretch here before we get to Q&A, really was interesting. This was um, really kind of flipped the whole discussion on its end. And this requires um, a host um, uh, locality host site agreement in qualified opportunity zones. Um, and this was taking the whole federally designated qualified opportunity zones and really using it to the advantage of rural counties in Virginia. So for, for the planners and others that have followed the, the federal opportunity zones, you know that if you meet certain um, income and uh, certain criteria uh, for a census tract, that you, you could potentially become a designated um, opportunity zone. And all of the 50 governors and uh, the heads of, of the territories 
they had to designate 20% of those census tracts as their designated opportunity zones. What this bill says, it's not just those designated tracts, but it's all tracts um, that meet those criteria and some of the adjacent ones. So what this map shows you, here's all of Virginia, where if you're gonna site a utility scale solar, you've got to um, get uh, the host locality's approval. Um, what does this mean? Well, um, so if you're gonna be five megawatts or greater, or greater than five megawatts, and you land on one of these, which is pretty much all the places these are going, um, you're gonna need to execute a siting agreement with the locality um, prior to getting either your PBR certificate or you know, your certificate from uh, the State Corporation Commission. What this does is it grants localities a lot of power in executing these siting agreements. So you can mitigate any of the impacts of, of the solar facility. Uh, you know, I'd mentioned the roads, um, that's one concern. Stormwater's a concern. If you're starting to put, um, you know, batteries, um, chemical batteries, the, that really plays into decommissioning, uh, issues related to that, even decommissioning the existing panels. Um, also, financial compensation to address the capital needs uh, set out um, in the capital improvement plan uh, adopted by the locality, and even certain um, current fiscal budget uh, limitations that a locality may have, um, and then any fiscal fund uh, balance. Also, um, any assistance in the application of the deployment of broadband. You know, with the, the hardening of the grid and, and the Grid Transformation Act of 2018, and I didn't touch on this, there's gonna need to be, um, you know, fiber and broadband to a lot of the infrastructure. Well, you can, um, as this is being deployed um, to these uh, facilities, you could um, get some dark fiber as a part of that that could be lit up and made available uh, to get broadband, which is a, definitely a priority in Virginia. And of course, with COVID-19, we're really seeing the need to get that to rural areas as well. I think this really um, is gonna be a game changer. We've already seen a couple localities uh, uh, ink a couple of these agreements. Um, and it speaks volumes too, because I think the, the industry um, actually supported the bill. We negotiated with them a little bit uh, on, the, on the bill uh, and they agreed to it. I think it points to the fact that there's a lot of money from Wall Street pouring into these projects and they wanna get these things approved at the local well level and they have the resources to help compensate those localities. You know, Amazon, um, Amazon, their, their, their big complex that they're building up in Northern Virginia, you know, a large part of what the, the Virginia sold them on is you can get um, renewable uh, sources of energy here in Virginia tied to that project that you can uh, contract purchase. And for a lot of uh, rural localities, I think prior to this bill coming along, they really felt like we were kind of the bedroom uh, energy communities of Northern Virginia in that you know, here we're supplying all this energy with uh, the resources we have and the land and the sun, but we're not getting uh, the impacts in terms of economic development, particularly in terms of jobs. But this is a way to kind of, I think, help offset that imbalance uh, here in Virginia. Um, the last note, um, and this goes back uh, to this uh, um, uh, comp plan review, is that um, if you uh, ink one of these deals, um, you know, you can go ahead and um, you don't have to have that comp plan review um, done by the locality. It, it just comes off the table. Um, it's important to note too, that this is applying to projects that haven't received approval yet um, from localities going all the way back to, to January 1st of, of this year. So um, if you hadn't received a, a, a final approval by then, um, you still need to get one of these um, host siting agreements. So that kind of runs through um, all of my slides, and I definitely wanted to leave plenty of time for Q&A. Um, so Christine, here we are on our last slide. Any questions uh, for the panelists? Great. Why, yes, we do. So go ahead, folks, type those questions in, um, and let's get started here. Our first question is, how does the PSC work with jurisdictions when the state and counties are possibly hostile to solar farms? Okay, so uh, that's a that, that's a great question, and um, you know the, the the rough answer is that we are we do we do our best to try to get um, uh, facilitate you know county participation in the uh, in the CPCM process. Although 
the counties and the locals don't always take us up on that. Um, I didn't I didn't cover this in my presentation, but there's a statutory requirement that the the PSC must uh, hold or must invite at least um, the local officials to sit with uh, the you know public utility law judge uh, during these um, public hearings that I mentioned, the public comment hearings. Um, and of course, you know the 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 statute and the PSC uh, practice and and regulations certainly uh, uh, allow for the the local governments to get uh, formally um, involved by inter intervening in the proceeding. But again, um, that hasn't always happened. Uh, it, it did happen in in uh, the Biggs Ford case that that I talked about and. It also did happen, although late in the game, in the LaGore Bridge case that, that I covered as well. Um, one of the things that, that I will mention is, um, you know, this has been a question, this, the, 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 the gauging the temperature, the question of how to get counties um, more involved, how to make sure and ensure that counties are able to present their, um, you know, uh, have an opportunity to raise their concerns. That's one of the things that uh, we are we are sensitive to at the commission, and we are going to try to address that as part of this future rulemaking. Okay, has the uh, the Public Service Commission ever denied a solar farm application uh, since it would be located on prime farmland? Um. <clears throat> That is a that is a good question, uh, and I think the commission did uh, uh, did do that. Or the PULJ did do that in the in the first um, phase of the Biggs Ford solar matter. Um, and it's interesting because uh, th the the denial was ultimately re reversed and remanded by the commission, not so much because of uh, the siting on the prime. Uh, farmland but it was really to give the as i mentioned to give the applicant an opportunity to 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 see if they could get a, a, the 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 necessary reclassification which 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 did not happen so um most of the cpcn cases that i've uh i'm familiar with <clears throat> they they have ultimately um come out uh, as a product of some kind of agreement, um, accommodation that, that was reached between the applicant and the county and the reviewing state agencies. So um, I would say uh, many, if not the majority of them that have come out uh, for the CPC as that have been uh, uh, granted, uh, they did reflect some sort of measure to accommodate some of these concerns of siting in particular. Um, you know, make sure that 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 the zoning um, uh, pro proper and appropriate zoning approvals were in fact um, uh, obtained. So, but I think we're kind of reaching the way that the the temperature and developments of of these type of applications um, are are the the temperature of it has actually come to the point where. Um, you know the frustrations have been mounting over time, and what we're seeing is uh, sort of that 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 coming to a head of, you know, the the solar the solar development uh, community really you know um, pushing back, starting to push back hard against the against the counties and and their what the developers are 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 saying that the county's trying to usurp the 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 uh, commission CPC and authority. So again. Um, we are at a point now on the on on the cusp of a a the next legislative session where uh, the the these affected stakeholders are talking to each other now and trying to resolve some of these concerns um, and come up with a proposal to our technical staff that is fair to uh, to all of them. Okay, uh, this one's good. Have either of you seen uh, or have heard uh, any desires for there to be utility scale solar combined with another use on the property, such as livestock grazing? And if so, examples, can we dive a little bit into that? Sure, you know, I, I it's always touted um, uh, as something a use like grazing under panels. Um, I think, uh, you know, 
you also see, um, and Virginia did this, they put together the Department of Environmental Quality, um, put together a report on pollinator uh, friendly species of, of plants, um, native, native plants that could be planted that could help surrounding agriculture. That's kind of another use. Um, I don't know of to date in Virginia of where that's been successful though, in terms of I think agricultural production maybe in between rows. Uh, you know, just kind of joking the other day around with some staff members, Virginia is going to be considering marijuana legalization. I wonder if that's a crop that could be easily grown in between the rows of some of these solar panels. Um, it probably doesn't take too much land. Um, uh, but I have not uh, to date seen maybe an example where they've really made this work in terms of making it uh, consistent with agriculture. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you couldn't have a very large um, uh, farm tract or assemblage of acres that still has farming in and around the solar panels, but not necessarily between the rows. I, hopefully that answers that question. And I think for us, and uh, it, 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 it has come up in conversation at, 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 a, min at a minimum of that level. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of, of uh, conditions that have been incorporated with an issued CPC and that expressly require and accommodation of you know these kind of dual dual use, although that's not to say that it couldn't happen because again you know how these things and these conditions can e can evolve in order to get a CPCN through the process. That's one of the things that that I I can see could be a reasonable you know accommodation, um, a reasonable condition. Uh, one of the things that I didn't mention and focus too much on are the, you know, kind of the legislative strategies that have been percolating, uh, you know, through uh, that we've gotten wind of at the commission, but then we've also heard about uh, being discussed with other agencies or so. Um, and so that that's that's another avenue where I think this, uh, the state could make a change um, in that direction if they if they if if you know there was support to do so. Uh, but you know that that is. Um, that is an issue that uh, certainly warrants further discussion. As as I'm, honestly, we're we're at a point in Maryland because of the the goals that we have on RPS, uh, especially if there's you know um, if the if the if if the state is going to move to 100%, uh, you know we're going to need solar. Um, we're going to we're going to need to to figure this out. Uh, the REDS task force did a great job last year trying to, you know, really find ways to look at other areas and incentivize solar siting and renewable siting uh, outside and apart from prime ag land. Uh, but, you know, it is, it is inevitable. It, it, we might come to the point where, where uh, we'll need to see, okay, well, uh, a certain amount has to be cited here and we need to see if there's a way that we can maximize uh, usage and to, to, you know, to, to get to where we need to. Okay, um, so on the flip side of animals grazing under the panels, um, have there been any unexpected issues uh, in regard to wildlife displacement as a result of these projects? Um, any recent developments of a best practice of sorts? You know, oh, I'm sorry, Joe. I, yeah, I mean, I'll go. Um, you know, I haven't heard um, specifically about this. I mean, when these projects, particularly through the DEQ, they try to address, you know, the wildlife impacts um, when they're reviewing these. You know, one interesting thing um, is a lot of these are fenced, ring fenced. And one of the concerns that I've heard, and I heard this at, at a local uh, planning commission meeting, was the impact to, say, local hunt clubs whose dogs are, are out uh, and then get caught behind the fences for whatever reason, so that, that an impact to, to maybe kind of a rural way of life uh, by these things being plopped in there. That's not necessarily a natural wildlife, but I mean, it's part of the the hunting and the local economy and the culture there that, that potentially has an impact. I think uh, definitely when you start to see in Virginia, not so much uh, agricultural land, but then forest land, I talked about that Spotsylvania project, that was over 6,000 acres of forest that were cleared. That's definitely gonna have an impact on, on wildlife. And I think that's a concern uh, amongst uh, some in Virginia. I, I know, you know that the Nature Conservancy is looking at a, at a mapping tool to kind of help 
um, site these things in areas where they'll have less impact to the, the kind of the natural landscape. Um, so it's really starting to get a lot more thought and um, uh, consideration. I, going back to the forestry, I think uh, the Department of Forestry is really tracking the loss of working forests in Virginia, and this is kind of adding to that concern. Yeah, in, in Maryland, it's it's fairly similar too. Um, as a matter of course, for every uh, a proposed project for a generating station, be it solar, be it um, any lar other, other large um, facility, even transmission lines and transmission projects, uh, the reviewing state agencies, and I, as I mentioned, PPRP coordinates that, but you know, you have the Department of Natural Resources, uh, Maryland Department of the Environment that, uh, as a matter of course, address impacts on, on the wildlife, and that's all reported and contained in the uh, PPRP's project assessment report that then gets filed with the commission. Now, um, you know, the, the, the license conditions are, are critical um, to each CPCN that's issued, and uh, those conditions could require, you know, the, the obtaining the proper, you know, permitting and uh, approvals from from uh, MDE, the Department of the Environment and Department of Natural Resources. And I can think of one case, um, <clears throat> I didn't discuss this in the presentation, but I can think of one particular case uh, recently by that in the, in the last uh, one or two years where uh, the CPCN issued, but the, uh, the, the recipient, the developer, was not able to get um, the, the necessary uh, permit that it was required to under the licensing conditions was not able to get it from um, the Department of the Environment uh, because of the impacts on I think it might have been either um, uh, watershed or or wetlands or something. But um, in in that particular instance, um, you know that that effect effectively you know Im impacted and, and kind of shut down the project. And in another uh, example, you know there 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 was the uh, a significant impact to to a deep. Uh, the, the, the removal of, of, of cutting down of trees. And so, you know, again, that uh, was something that um, was significant enough for the Department of Environment to essentially, you know, um, uh, report to the commission that, that, it, that the project did not um, satisfy the requirement under the licensing condition. So um, as to the, as to the, the impacts on wildlife, you know, they are routinely examined as part, as a matter of course, for through these proceedings, but then the outcome of which um, the uh, the enforcement of the license conditions in order to kind of you know keep that in check is is, is very sensitive. Okay, thank you. Um, next one: Is there an effort to and this is in regards specifically, I guess, to Maryland, but could be applicable elsewhere? Is there an effort to either require comprehensive plans to have energy elements? or are solar developers always just going to have to go to the court after a CPCN is approved? Um, so it, I think if I understand the question correctly, you know, the, 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 the comprehensive plan uh, falling within the jurisdiction of the, the local, local jurisdiction, the local government, so the the commission can the commission doesn't direct and cannot say what the uh, comprehensive plan can and should or should not have in terms of requirements. Um, where things come to the head is where uh, the you know the, the commission were to issue a CPCN, um, let's say over the objection uh, of the of the county, the local municipality, and that example is you know, the Wix Ford example that I discussed, then what happens? Um, <clears throat> then what happens when, when, uh, when uh, either for the county or for the developer, because two scenarios would be the county would then, you know, take that off to court. Um, <clears throat> so that's one, that's one recourse. But then from the developer standpoint, if they then, then go to the county um, and, and let's say as part of the CPCN, they need to get that sign off from the county for its, uh, you know, site, site plan. And, and uh, the county um, objects, or let's say um, uh, responds in a way that makes it uh, uh, impossible to get signed off or to to give its you know, approval. Then what happens, and what's the recourse to the developer at that point? And 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 I think we're at that. We we have not seen that happen. We may see it happen <laughs> with Bigs Ford, although I I can't speak for the counties, but I can I would imagine that if if I were the attorney. Uh, advising the the uh, you know and my client worthy a developer you know I I 
you know, I, I don't know what other recourse I would have other than, uh, apart from trying to negotiate. If I couldn't, then then other than legal action. Um, so, you know, whether or not the counties will um, start to look at um, energy, uh, uh, you know, energy uh, accommodations, incorporating those into their site plans, that that I can't speak to. But uh, one of the things I can um, say is that in this past year uh again as part of the red the reds task the governor's task force um the the department of planning did take the lead on developing a resource um for counties to help counties navigate the sort of like the 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 legal decisions that have come out from the commission and the issues that uh that were highlighted in those uh opinions from the commission um and that particular resource was intended, is intended to help, you know, get, get help the counties get some insight as to what the the, the type of um, uh, factors and and issues that that the that the PULJs of commissions regularly look at. Um, and who knows that might um, that might have the effect of of uh, you know assisting the counties in, in revising their 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 comprehensive plan um, objectives. Uh, or site plan requirements, I can't I can't say, but there is uh, uh, a, a, um, a repository resource that's now available that wasn't before, but is now available for to help um, you know the local governments. Yeah, you know, in Virginia, we've seen a lot of great work from counties that are updating their comprehensive plans to look at a lot of these siting issues. Um, you know, they will maybe map their prime agricultural soils or their soils of, of statewide significance and maybe give a priority to not siting them in these areas when considering a special use application. Um, one of the things that I have tabbed here in this integrated resource plan that I, I was looking at was Dominion Energy, which I meant, once again had said is the largest incumbent utility here. They're gonna be coming out with some capacity maps of where in the grid you could place these things. In other words, I think that might be very helpful for, for counties and localities in Virginia to see is where is their capacity to cite these things because it would give a lot of information. Now, having said that, if you're a developer and you can amass a great quantity of land and it's not even in, in an area where there's capacity, you may have the backing of Wall Street to go ahead and just build an, an extra substation to make it work um, that, that we're seeing. The other thing I, we try to encourage our members to look at too is, Consider creative ways to maybe marry the, you know, the solar issue or the renewable energy issue with some of your economic uh, development objectives. You may be trying to uh, market some, um, you know, some industrial zone sites. And if one of the things you can sell is maybe access to maybe per potentially purchasing by contract energy that's produced in that county, that could be helpful. I know one of the counties that's seen a lot of uh, solar energy development, it was just in the news today here locally in Virginia, is Mecklenburg County uh, down in Southern Virginia near um, uh, North Carolina border. And they actually have data centers that have been loading, locating there as well. So maybe marrying those two um, could be uh, something that could be really beneficial as you consider um, your comprehensive plan updates. We actually have several questions regarding um, locations of these solar panels um, or solar power. And I'm going to um, encourage uh, those folks to look at one of our previous webcasts that we had actually hosted by the Virginia chapter. It was August 21st and it was called Planning for Utility Scale Solar Energy Facilities. And it really kind of goes into um, the location of things and, you know, um, habitats and if they're disturbed and uh, there's a question here about utilizing gray fields you know will that work can you put solar panels on top of an old airport lot or parking lot or something like that so um i encourage folks to to take a look at at that recording um one question here this is interesting regarding location we haven't talked about offshore solar farms um so the question is, are offshore solar farm designations set by federal, state, or local authorities? And is there a mileage range from the coast? Um, so do any, do either of you have any experience with, with offshore solar? I don't have experience with offshore solar. Um, I, I, I think 
just from a very, very high level, you know, kind of jurisdictional consideration, is that if it's if it's territory that's not owned by the state, and we did we did we do did experience this with with offshore wind, then um, <clears throat> then the commission, our commission, uh, there's the there's the the first question would be whether or not the commission would have even jurisdiction to to uh, to require. I mean, I would think. Uh, I would think that um, that an, an offshore project would be large enough in scale that it would otherwise qualify for uh, under would be subject to the CPC and requirement for us anyway. Um, and in which case, if that if that is true, you know, there I think that jurisdiction question would first need to be answered before the commission would then make the requirement of of uh of having to go through the the you know, the commission review process and this in the state agency review process but um you know again taking take two steps back here i i i'm not i'm not aware or familiar with any offshore solar um yeah, that you know have come before the commission and uh for us yeah that's um i have never heard of that that's never heard of offshore solar offshore wind obviously i've heard of and it's real big in virginia and has the potential to really um ramp up economic development and job and manufacturing opportunities particularly out of the port of virginia and it could reverberate throughout the state um i have to imagine you know it just wouldn't be economically uh feasible um one thing that i have seen um somewhat pictures of a little bit in, in online literature is placing solar panels say on bodies of water inland particularly reservoirs, because um, it's a use there and it could help um, uh, eliminate or reduce evaporation of a water source. So there could be some things there. You know, Christine, you had mentioned, you know, about gray fields, and I think it, it kind of comes into this discussion. It, we're really talking about economies of scale. And, you know, while gray fields is great, I think there's going to need to be even more incentive or some sort of state or federal subsidy beyond what's there for kind of uh, industrial scale solar in these larger plots of land, um, because it, just the economies of scale right now, I mentioned Wall Street earlier, they're pouring their money into the bigger projects and we're starting to see more of those. Okay, um, it's 2.30, we have to wrap up. There are still so many good questions. Um, so so folks, please reach out to, to our presenters with those questions, because there's some really good ones. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone who put who put questions in for me here. And thanks to you, Joey and Joe, <laughs> um, for joining us today. Uh, this is an important topic and it's complicated. Um, and uh, we, th we thank you for being here. Folks, don't forget we're recording this. Um, we're gonna be posting it on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast Series. It'll pop up in case you wanna share it with others. We'll also have a PDF copy of the slide decks available on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And Christine, um, so, yeah, yeah. just real, real quick, even beyond sure. questions, if you guys got information to share, because we're always in the learning mode here in Virginia, anything that's going on in your state or things that you know, that'd be great. So yes. I, I would welcome that, yeah. You know. Wonderful, okay. Well, everyone, hey, have a, have a great day. For some of you, maybe we'll see you again tomorrow. I have another webcast coming up tomorrow, um, the avant-garde staff report. So feel free to join us for that one too. Don't forget to record those CM credits because they're law uh, if you need them for the end of your reporting period. Folks, have a great day and we'll talk next time. Thanks. Great, thank you. <laughs>